Welcome back to the YouTube channel, everyone. And if you're new to the channel, let me apologize in advance. My videos are normally upbeat and focus on the growth and exciting ventures within property. And this is kind of the opposite, okay? What happens when you need to evict a tenant? It's not the most exciting, but this wouldn't be a proper investing channel if I didn't talk about the downsides or something to be thinking about with the downsides of property investment. So let's jump straight in and get started with this. As I said, property isn't always all rosy. And the problem I think with, and why a lot of people give up in property and investment in general is this sort of rose tinted glasses that they're going around in. It's almost like you've got the mindset of, hey, I tell you what, I'm gonna buy this shithole property, put some money into it, provide a great home for a tenant, and they'll just move in, live there for the next 30 years and just pay me a rent on an ongoing basis, right? Well, sometimes yes, and actually a lot of the times yes, if you create a great home for people, but there are some knobs out there that actually don't see you doing them any favors at all. And if anything, you're just a corporate that's getting in their way and they feel that paying rent is somewhat optional within their rights. So how do we overcome that? First thing that we want to separate with this is section 21 and section eight. These are very different. I'm gonna go through them separately, but the thing to think about is a section 21 is a possession order. What's the chances I'm spelling this incorrectly? A possession order and section eight is an eviction order. It's very, very simple, but people get these wrong all the time. Section 21 is when it comes to the end of your contract term. For example, let's say you give somebody a one year's notice and you give them notice, hey, at the end of this 12 months, um, I wanna take possession of the property. You have automatic rights. They don't need to have done anything wrong. It's just, that's our agreement, okay? That's our contract. A section eight, is when somebody's done something wrong. Either they're causing a nuisance and neighbors are complaining, they've been causing damage to your property, they've not been paying you rent and some more. But for now, what you need to remember is the difference between section 21 and section eight. I'm gonna go through the differences and how you can get them involved in the most concise way that I could possibly deliver. So the first thing to be considering is before you actually get a tenant in. So in the UK right now, there are several documents that you need before. Now, this is really important because if they move in and you haven't given them the document, the right documentation, then it's going to cause some issues when you need to get them out of the property, if you need to get them out. And actually, it's very hard to remove somebody or evict somebody if you haven't done this right. So the first one is a how to rent. I know it's kind of weird, but this is a government document. You have to give them the most up-to-date one. Um, they don't update it very often, and it is on the government website, okay? And it's a how to rent in the UK guide, including do they have the right to rent and things like that. So there's quite a lot in that document. I'm not gonna go through it. It's very basic, but you have to make sure you have produced them with that. The second thing is an EPC. Now, an EPC is an energy performance certificate and the requirements of minimum standards will go up over time. Um, at the moment, it's relatively low, but it will go higher and higher. And it's all about the energy performance of the house. The reason for this is they need to have a good idea or they're meant to give them an idea is the ongoing obligations financially of heating the property, etc. How many tenants do you know getting their EPC and going, oh, it's E-rated, I'll do my research and find out what the average three bed semi-detached property is at rate E or D. They don't, but you need to at least have given them that right. The next thing, no, wrong Roman numeral. The next thing within this is making sure that you've given them the gas safety certificate. This is actually really important for a couple of reasons. Number one, a lot of you that haven't done this, you might find that actually it's not up to the books. So you need to make sure you've got your gas safety, safety gas safety, 
your gas safety certificate in place and make sure any works that are needed get done to the central heating system to make sure that it's economical and safe enough for your tenant to use. Finally, deposits. Now, a majority of you will be getting your deposit, but sorry, a deposit on your property. What you do need to do is put it into some sort of deposit protection scheme. I'm gonna say that again, you cannot keep that money in your bank account and you have to put it into a protective scheme of their deposit and you have 30 days from doing that to give them the paperwork to confirm it. Otherwise, you can get sued for quite a lot of money. Can't remember the exact figure, but it's a multiple of the deposit amount. And so most tenants don't know that, but they will if you ever try to evict them because they get told by charities and things like that to expose you on that. So more on that later. But before they even move in, how to rent guide, energy performance certificate, gas safety certificate, and make sure you've lodged their deposit with a a deposit protection scheme and make sure you've given them the paperwork of proof of that within 30 days of you lodging that deposit. So let's go back to section eight. Now remember section eight is the actual eviction notice. So first of all with this remember it could do with lack of paying rent, damages to the property or any issues that have gone there and you need to remember a couple of things when you are issuing this. The first of which is try not to issue it. I know that sounds absolutely crazy, but if you get to the point of issuing a section eight notice, it's usually because you and the tenant are not getting on. And the best way of dealing with this is effective communication, coming to some sort of agreement with the tenant of a property for a surrender, i.e. giving you the keys back and moving on. Whatever motivation is there to do so will help because once you go down the court route, most people will seek advice and the advice out there is very, very anti-landlord, which we'll go through in a moment. So the best thing to do is have great communication. The other thing is when you are issuing a section eight, if it's within two months of the end of the contract, let's say it's a six month contract and it's month five, then you can give two months notice immediately with section 21. So even though you're issuing your section eight for a, an eviction notice, you can also issue the section 21 for a possession notice at the same time. And it's much easier going through the section 21 route rather than the section eight route because they're completely separate um, and there's no loopholes for the tenant to get around with the section 21 notice. So the reason that's important is the tenant can dispute the section 28. So for example, let's say that you issue a section 28 through lack of getting rents and you haven't had rent for the last two months or three months or something like that. And then they go to citizens advice or they go to shelter, which I'll be honest, I'm not a fan of shelter. I know that's a bit of a taboo because they're a charity, but they're very anti-landlord and actually it's always looking after the small guy um, and often you know the idea of landlords is that we're all multi-millionaires and it couldn't make any difference but actually a lot of uh, investors have two or three properties and they're quite reliant on that income right so i'm not a biggest fan but what they could do is find a loophole of getting to that court if they dispute it you then have to go to court um, for possession and that eviction notice and then they could pay a certain amount and then they're no longer officially in um, arrears. So there's a lot of loopholes within that. So I much prefer section 21. So section 21, if we go through the differences there, you don't need any reason to issue this apart from the fact it's coming towards the end of your contract. Now some quick things on this, they need to have been in the property for a minimum of four months before you can issue a section 21, a possession order, and you must give two months notice, okay? Now, I don't wanna stress this too much, but I can't really stress it enough. You must give two months notice and you must wait four months from when they've moved in the property to issue it. If you decided to issue your section 21 and you hear people going, oh yeah, just issue the section 21 straight away. No, don't do that, okay? If you issue it too soon and they get the right advice, it can be voided, okay? And once it's voided, you're done, 
okay? So you need to be really careful of that. So wait four months, that's a minimum of four months, and you must give two months notice. Also, another tip is make sure that there's no complaints about the property. So for example, if the tenant's saying, hey, look, there's a problem with the shower, I need that sorting and things like that, make sure you're still keeping up with your obligations. A lot of landlords I know go, oh, they're moving out in two months, what's the problem? Well, actually, there's a big problem because if they report you to the local council because of not doing that sort of thing and the council officially says they're getting involved to have a look at it, your section 21 or your section 28 is now voided. Okay, and you wanna do everything you can to keep up with the process of this. Kind of like in um, with a company, if you've got a disagreement with a company, you still pay the company what they're due based on your contract, you complain in the background and then try and get it back. Okay, if you stop paying them in the eyes of the law, you're the one who's in breach of contract, which you definitely don't wanna be within this situation. Two final things that I'm gonna say on this is number one, make sure the section 21 and the section eight is in writing, okay? So it is actually legally binding verbally, but really hard to prove a conversation and it's your word against them and you've got a motivation to get them out so you're going to say the right thing for you they want to stay in the property so they're going to say the same thing um, to protect themselves and when you do put it in writing make sure you use the right form which is on the government website and the form you want to use is form 6a okay not 6b form 6 a. There are other forms on there which I'm going to go through, but that is the one you want to use for section 21. Linking back to section 8, and I'm going to read this from my notes because I never remember it, but what you want to go to is the Schedule 2 of the Housing Act 1988. And what it's going to say is notice seeking possession of a property let on an assured tenancy or assured agricultural occupancy. Now this is for the section uh, eight. Again, I'll say that again, it's a schedule two of the Housing Act 1988, where you're going to find this. And it's to get people out for wrongful doing. So it could be um, lack of rent damages, causing a nuisance in the area, things like that. So in terms of the notice period for this, you need to give a minimum of two weeks notice and up to two months notice. Now it depends how quickly you can move around. It also depends on the situation because of can't say the word on YouTube, but the stuff that's been happening in the last year, um, it's obviously caused a little bit of disparity and giving tenants even more rights, um, which I think is actually fair enough given the situation. But you can give them two weeks to two months notice. And again, very particular forms that you're going to use. Now, the first option is the accelerated forms, okay? And the accelerated method is obviously going to accelerate the process, but you can only go after the accelerated process of getting them out if you're not looking to get back the arrears on rent. Now, a lot of you will want to, but it depends how far back they are. For me, I just let it go a lot of the time because it's bloody hard getting anything out of it and it draws out the process massively. So for me, I like going for the accelerated process just to expedite it and get rid of the tenant and move on to somebody that's actually gonna pay for the home that I'm providing for them. So the great thing about this is that often there's no hearing needed because you're not trying to get back rent. All it is is going, look, I haven't been paid. I just want this person to go. There's not much argument to make in court. So there's often no hearing. It's expedited. And then the form that you're going to want on there is the N5B. And the form that you're going to want from this is the N5B. Again, you need to make sure you're filling in the right forms because if you make a mistake, it's, it, it's done. You need to start again the whole process, okay? So again, this is for the accelerated version, the N5B form, and the benefit is that you're going to expedite the process and there's no court hearing. A lot of the time there's no court hearing unless they appeal it, which most don't. But the downside is you're not gonna be collecting any of those rental arrears that really you should have in your pocket in the first place. If you wanna go down the standard process, then you're still gonna to have to issue the N5B, which is going to be to get them out, but you're also gonna to wanna to issue the N119, and the N119 form is the possession of arrears. So what you're trying to do is get back the money that's um, there. Now, the downside of this is you will likely have to go to court for it, um, and the likeness of actually getting in money even if the the courts say you need to pay them very low because 
Once a tenant decides to pay, most of the time they don't. And it also just drags out the entire process. So hopefully it goes really smoothly. And this is why I say communication is key. Better to come to an outside agreement to move on. But if not, that's the process you're going to need to go down. So it's the N119 and the N5B if you're looking to get them out and get possession of arrears. The issue is what happens if they complain and they refuse to leave even after you've gone to court and the court says get out and give them the money. Does that mean they leave? No, it doesn't. What happens then is you need to pay for court bailiffs to go round. Now again, this can take six to eight weeks on top of that, which is an absolute ball leg. So if you think about this whole process, it can be a six month process. Again, another benefit of you communicating effectively with tenants and just saying, hey, look, what can we agree for you to move on from this property? Sign this waiver to say you're out, change the locks, etc. It really does save you a lot of heartache because it's not just the cost of the court, the bailiffs, etc. It's actually the problems that you're going to come up against, which brings me on to charities. Now, I'm big on charities. I love charities, but I'm going to be completely open. And if you're from shelter, I'm sorry. I hate shelter. I hate them. I think they're an awful charity. And the reason why I don't like charities like that is they, I don't think they believe in win-win situations. I think they believe landlords are evil and tenants are poor victims of situations, okay? And the reason I, I'm not a big fan of that is the advice isn't, oh, hey, how about you pay your rent? or anything like that, or why don't you enter into a conversation about some sort of rental agreement? A lot of the advice, and I've got friends that work there, and I still love you, don't worry, um, but actually a lot of the advice is how to get out of it on a continuous basis, which I'm not a fan of. So for example, if you're in a risk, or by the way, if you drag it out to the court date and then you pay this amount, they have to start the process over and over again. So I'm not a massive fan of that. But whatever my opinion is, it doesn't really matter. What's important is that actually a three month process becomes a six month process, becomes a nine month process. I've heard of people trying to evict tenants for up to two years, even by following the right process. So if you can issue a section 21, issue a section 21 and go down that route and get court uh, bailiffs if needed. If you can get away with any paperwork whatsoever and you can just have a communicative um, an open conversation with your tenant, then that's always going to be best. So look, this may not be the video that you wanted to watch, but it's definitely one everyone investing in property needs to watch. And if you've made it this far and you've got some value, I'd love it if you could just leave a like and let me know in the comments, by the way, if I've missed anything out, what you thought, and of course, if you've ever had to evict any tenants, I'd love to hear your story and I'd like to share more of mine. If you're new to the channel and you want more no BS property investment advice, then this is definitely the channel for you. Do me a favor, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you're notified when the next video comes up. And whilst you're typing up and doing that sort of thing, you might wanna check up this video to my left.